Hi, and welcome to the Leadership Development Armory Lesson 12. We are going to be going through a series where we look at understanding the different types of people groups that youth leaders will interact with. Today, we'll be hearing from Matthijs Ahrens about understanding young adults. Please be mindful that because this video was recorded on Zoom, the quality of the audio and visuals isn't great, but the quality of the content is exceptional. We hope that this lesson is of value to your ministry. Please enjoy. Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, and welcome to the Armory season three. Uh, we're really happy to be back. Um, it's been a little bit since we've been able to jump on. We had, you know, a couple of different events, and then it was the holidays. And so I, we just kind of took a break until things kind of settled down. Um, for those of you that don't know, my name is Summer Bussey and I'm the Christian Education Director for the Western Territory Youth Department. Um, and over the next few weeks, we're gonna be going through a series about understanding different types of people who youth leaders interact with. Um, and that ranges from primary kids all the way through officers. Um, and we're gonna be hearing from various experts in the youth department throughout the next few weeks. And I'm really excited to introduce you to Matthijs who is our Young Adult Ministries and Mission Director, and he's gonna be talking about understanding young adults. Um, so that's really exciting. Uh, as a reminder, our overall objective is to create a space for diligent learning in order to develop and equip youth leaders, but we also want this to be a safe space to learn new things, ask questions, and make connections with fellow youth leaders in the Salvation Army. Um, so we're really happy that you all jumped on. A little bit about Tice. Um, Tice runs our service core teams as part of his job, um, and he's been doing that for about the last two years. And before that, he taught college students ESL and worked at the Glendale Corps in Southern California. Um, and Tice has a ton of experience and a plethora of knowledge on this topic, so we're really excited to hear what he has to say. Um, but we are first going to open up in prayer, and so I would just ask uh, Major Emmanuel Masango if you would be willing to open us up. I'm so sorry. I cannot get my mic to work. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to gather in this manner. Uh, we ask that you may bless our time together and help us to learn and grow uh, through the presentation today. I uh, would thank you for everybody on this call and for their devotion to you and to the Ministry of the Youth to the Salvation Army in the Western Territory. Thank you for all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Tice, take it away. Hello, everyone. Um, I am very excited to talk uh, about young adult ministry. Um, young adults have a very big place in my heart uh, ever since I was a young adult. I say was because I don't feel like a young adult anymore, but, um, but I'm very excited to talk to you about young adult ministry and what you can do. Um, you know what? Actually, I'm so sorry. I need to change this slide. I don't like this slide. Can we... All right. Let's try again. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about young adult ministry and the amazing things. You know what? Actually, I'm so sorry. This slide. Also, this isn't this isn't quite the right fit. Let me let me try this one because I, I think this might be a better. Yeah, I like this one. All right. Hello. My name is Matthijs. I'm here to talk about young adult ministry. I wanted to talk start with um, showing you different slides, different um, options of things you can do. Um, I'm not a graphic designer by any means, but uh, the way you present things to your people, whether they're young adults or kids or seniors or whoever it is, it matters. If you're thinking to yourself, I don't know what these kids like. I don't know what these young adults like. Do what I did. Search up brands that uh, are popular to young adults. You can just Google what do young adults like. Um, and you can base uh, some of your, your things off of that. So for instance, I chose Nike and Pink as two brands that came up. Um, and I tried to model my slides after that. Don't worry for the rest of the time. It's going to look like this. Um, but all that to say, you can do research uh, by Googling things. If you're like, I don't even know where to begin. I don't understand these people. It's okay. Take a deep breath. Google, what do young adults like? That can go very far. But I'm here to talk about what a young adult is. Um, I want to start by pointing out that every young adult is an individual, just like all grown adults, uh, meaning there are only so many broad statements you can apply to young adults. However, there are similarities and trends that we see when it comes to this age group. Um, if nothing else, uh, you can take away the point of uh, young adults 
being a young adult means that your life is in a regular state of change and being willing to uh, adapt uh, to their needs and to their their growing their changes in life that is key so if nothing else i hope you remember that young adults are constantly changing uh, as individuals um, when we talk about young adults um, i am using the term young adult to describe people between the ages of 18 and 28. Uh, some studies uh, refer to people uh, in this category as 18 to 30 years old uh, but in the youth department at THQ, we tend to use the 18 to 28, 10-year period um, for our programming, like Service Corps or Anthem. Um, so with that in mind, that means that the current young adults of today were born between 1996 and 2006. Let that sink in for a minute. Um, now, this talk is not specifically about millennials or Gen Z, although many of them are young adults. Uh, instead, this is a talk about what a young adult is. Uh, beyond the specifics of this generation of young adults, I'm just talking about what it is to be a young adult. Um, and keep in mind, there are people who are older than 30 who would consider themselves young adults, and there are people under the age of 28 who feel like they're not in the same age category as adults who are younger than them. Uh, so the term can be flexible, uh, but we'll talk about that. Um, growing up, um, young adults, Young adults were not always adults. They were children at one point, and things in the world affected them, whether they wanted them to or not. Um, so when they were kids, uh, certain things would have been popular. Uh, if not for themselves, then their peers would have grown up following certain TV shows or movies or video games or technologies and things like that, um, which would have stood out to them uh, at key moments in their lives. Uh, for example, uh, the Pokemon show first came to America in 1998 when I was six years old. Um, by the time I was seven, just a year later, the Pokemon movie had come out. It was this, this global phenomenon, um, and it was incredibly popular. Kids my age, maybe a little older, would play the games, would buy all the, the t-shirts and things like that. Um, and so by the time that they made the Pokemon movie in 1999, my love of the franchise was solidified. And as I got older, I assumed that everyone had the same relationship to Pokemon that I did. But if I had been a few years younger than I am, um, maybe the, the franchise wouldn't have grabbed my attention uh, as it did when I was six years old. Um, or if I was a few years older, maybe I would have thought Pokemon was for babies, right? Or for little kids. Uh, all that to say, the things that... Uh, affect young adults uh, when they were growing up that will have an impact on them and their worldview. Specifically, uh, adding to that, there are things in the world, um, political and historical factors which, would, which have affected young, uh, young adults. So thinking about this particular generation, um, things uh, they may have been affected by include gun violence. Uh, almost all have had active shooter trainings in their schools. Some have experienced um, only touchscreen phones. They don't remember any of the button phones. Um, many grew up in states where cannabis was considered a normal part of life. Uh, many didn't grow up with the idea of don't accept rides from strangers because rideshare apps like Uber and, um, uh, and Lyft would have been perfectly normal. All this to say, the things uh, in the world around us have an effect on us and on the things that we value. So thinking about the young adults of this particular generation that will change in a few years, but think about not just what they like now, but what maybe affected them when they were growing up. Um, now, again, not all young adults are the same. Uh, their community, their state, their school, their, their family, cultural heritage, economic status, all of these would have affected their stories. Recognizing that uh, for your individual young adults is very important. Um, and not just, again, big communities, but individual people, uh, individual young adults. Um, everyone is an individual. So you might find that your young adults um, maybe are all similar and have similar interests, but no two people are exactly the same. Young adults tend to value respect uh, and they see themselves as independent decision makers in the world. So it's a good idea to avoid judgmental attitudes around a young adult's life or their interests. Uh, especially if it has something to do with their identity. Uh, you might have the weird kids. That's okay. The weird kids need Jesus too. All right. 
but now let's just open it up. What is a young adult? Like there's this age group component, but, but what does it mean? Um, now the line between a young adult and a regular adult may feel fuzzy, um, but I think most of us recognize that socially, if not mentally and emotionally, these new adults are unique to other adults in various ways. Uh, in academic circles, these people are called emerging adults. Uh, bare minimum, that means they're, they're 18 years old. Uh, and when you're 18 years old, you're able to legally uh, vote, enlist in the military, sign a legal contract, uh, become eligible for jury duty, live independent from your parents, consent to medical care, uh, work a full-time job, get married, and consent to intimacy with someone who's over 18. Um, think about what that means. 18-year-olds can make decisions regarding their own lives, and they can make decisions which affect other people's lives too, right? Voting and jury duty, um, taking lives and risking their own life for their country. These are things that 18-year-olds can do. Um, and there are a few things that 18-year-olds are not legally old enough to do until they get a little bit older. Um, but on the whole, when you turn 18, um, there's a whole world of possibility that just opens up midnight the, the, the day you turn 18, um, right? A single second just changes everything. Now, before turning 18, their world was a little bit different. Suddenly, the world treats them very differently. Um, so before they turned 18, um, they didn't have the same level of power or responsibility that they do now. Both of those things skyrocket their freedom and responsibility. Um, meanwhile, all the safety nets uh, of being a child completely fall away. Um, a quick anecdote, uh, the actress Emma Watson uh, remembers that after walking outside of her house on her 18th birthday, there were photographers who were lying on the ground to take photos uh, of her skirt, which by virtue of her age was suddenly legal for them to do. Uh, so the, we know the world can be very cruel to children, but it has no mercy for adults. And this sudden change uh, has a real effect on people. Uh, some people adjust to this change very quickly, but many take years to really settle into the reality that their world is now different. Um, I don't know if there are parents of young adults here, but I think um, I think if you're a parent of a young adult, maybe you also recognize that, wow, that's a struggle to accept that, you know, my baby is no longer a baby. Again, uh, there's this, there are some things that 18 year olds cannot do, 19 year olds cannot do. Um, that's because society recognizes that even after becoming a legal adult, there is still growth and learning which needs to take place um, even after entering society as an adult. Uh, bear in mind this conflicting position that young adults are in. They're old enough to pay taxes and you know, on a jury duty, you, you can decide the fate of a person's life, but you cannot purchase alcohol uh, for your own wedding until you reach, you know, 21, right? You, you see that, that, that contradiction? Um, when society demands that you serve as a part of the community while also doubting your wisdom or intelligence, it's hard to know who you are and what you're capable of. Uh, looking beyond 18, uh, it's common for people to assume that young adults uh, do certain things or live certain lives or that they should live certain lives. Um, many people expect young adults will uh, leave school and maybe opt for more schooling and somehow pay for it and then start with a low level job and then, you know, work onto a bigger job, a career, then get married and then have kids and then have two to, you know, two, three kids and then a dog, right? Uh, adults assume this, many young adults assume that this is the path that their lives will lead. However, we know that that's not the reality. Uh, many people live different lives than this. Um, th these two graphics are from the Fuller Youth Institute um, and really just highlight the fact that most of us don't have a clear cut pathway uh, that we expected in life. Life happens, things change, nothing is certain, especially outside of church communities. Um, young adults may or may eventually do work or schooling or, or relationships in a different light than what some of us may think is normal. Um, for me personally, uh, this is my path. Uh, maybe yours was similar, right? Like I, I left high school and I went straight to college, but I also traveled abroad. And then after graduating college, I had this time where I wasn't working, but I had an internship, but eventually I got a job. And 
then I had a different job and then COVID and I had all these roommates, but also I was also in a relationship and I got married at that time. It, it's complicated. Um, and it's not clear cut. Um, some of your young adults won't go to college. Some will only ever live at home. Uh, some may join a family business or work multiple jobs. Some may have had kids before even starting high school. Um, young adults are a mixed bag. And as you do ministry with young adults, remember that where you think they should be and maybe where they want to be may not be where they actually are. Uh, one of the key defining features of young adults is what I would say is a lack of grounding. That's not to say that young adults are flighty or careless, but nearly everything in their life is in a state of transition. School doesn't last forever. No one expects to get their dream job on their first uh, application. Housing is not permanent. Relationships, if existent, are often new or still growing. And many young adults aren't even thinking about having kids. Uh, what that means is that being a young adult means you're in the mindset that nothing is permanent. Uh, they feel a need to explore as much as possible. And many of them believe that all of the big decisions in life can happen later in, in life. Uh, and this is our fault as a society, right? Um, older adults are the ones, you know, constantly telling them, this is the time to explore, have fun, you know, don't, don't settle, you know, just yet, you know, I'm old, I can't do these things. Um, and the truth is, is that when you, when we speak, young adults, they do listen, they do hear us. Um, so then the question becomes, when do I become a real adult? Um, at, for, for some 18 to 24 year olds, they feel that turning 25 is an important milestone. And many young adults fear turning 30 um, because that means you're old. Um, and although added years can bring life changes and more experience, being a young adult is more about the mentality that things are not permanent rather than age. So that's why young adults may be more hesitant to commit to certain things when it comes to jobs or relationships or living situations, even joining a church community. When they know that their lives are in a state of regular and consistent change, uh, it can be hard to believe uh, or maybe even frightening to think that things can be permanent or things won't change. Uh, so then transitioning out of being an adult, um, if young adults, if being a young adult means you don't have a, a sense of permanency, then gaining the mindset of, of planning for the future, planning uh, really long term, uh, is what can start the process of people feeling like they're no longer a young adult. Um, having a job that you want to stay at for a number of years means you're thinking long term. Uh, making life decisions with another human being, maybe for the first time. Um, planning for your children's future, not just having kids, but actually planning for the future of your children. Like, these are all examples of thinking beyond the next few years. Um, even living alone uh, shows that you're thinking long term. Uh, a short term mindset means, you know, oh, you, maybe I have bad roommates that I can tolerate. Uh, oh, but they're only temporary. I'll only live with them, you know, for a few months or maybe a year. But if you have a long term mindset, uh, that means maybe you want to invest in your living space uh, over, you know, maybe a number of years, uh, possibly bringing a spouse into that home, perhaps raising children there. Um, uh, all this to say that you may find uh, someone in the young adult range who is thinking just in the next few months or maybe the next year or even just like two, three years, um, maybe different than someone who's thinking past the next three years, maybe five years, 10 years down the line. Um, and so with that in mind, you may find that some people in the young adult age range uh, may not feel like they're in the same life situation as other young adults, particularly if they're married, if they have children. Um, these life changes, even early on, can cause people to see themselves as adults rather than as young adults. You know, if young adults still figuring out their lives, but things like um, sustainable income, marriage, these can cause people to stop feeling like a young adults. Um, on the other hand, older young adults uh, who may not have had these changes in life uh, may begin to have a shift in mindset when their peers go through these life changes. Um, so those that see their friends who are married or have kids or, or have a career um, uh, might try to emulate that mindset. Um, typically, this tends to round off at about age 30 when people begin thinking long term. Uh, and those approaching age 30, again, may 
begin to anticipate being old or just begin to adjust emotionally into their, their life situation. Um, for that reason, we, uh, in the youth department, we say service core anthem. We tend to stick around that 18 to 28 age range. Uh, again, that's when we tend to see people's minds shifting from, oh, you know, everything's, you know, non-permanent and things can change to, no, no, I, I have to plan months in advance because I'm already planning years in advance. Again, these are, are difficult concepts, but, but bear with me. Add on to the complication of being a young adult. People are wanting to, uh, people are waiting longer to have kids. People are disillusioned by marriage. Um, companies are less loyal to their employees. The housing market's crazy. No one feels like they can afford a house. Any of these things are, are tied to uh, economic instability. Instead of working nine to five, many young adults feel like they have to work five to nine, right? Like 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, so when your job doesn't pay you great benefits, when you have multiple jobs to make ends meet, uh, you know, you, you might not feel like you can live on your own and afford a wedding and support a spouse and bring a child into the world. Uh, you know, if the assumption is that you need to follow that linear path uh, I showed earlier, um, and when your life doesn't reflect that, you may feel like you need more time to pursue certain life goals, um, you know, before claiming that you're a real adult. But that's really what being a young adult is. Uh, it's taking this time to grow, to really settle into who you are. Um, and young adults aren't slowing themselves down, um, you know, before settling down. They are told by society and their life situation that they don't count as a real adult. Um, in different times and cultures, when, uh, you know, adulthood would have started at age 13 or 14, uh, but now there are social and economic challenges, which are new for everyone. Um, so if you find that in your communities, you have older adults who are struggling to emphasize, uh, empathize with the younger adults, you know, calling them entitled or lazy, it's worth remembering that everything is new for young adults and they feel uh, a need in their own lives to focus on their own growth and development before they're ready to join the larger community. Um, so with all of that in mind, that's a lot, but with all of that in mind, let's talk about young adults in the church. When it comes to bringing young adults into church, um, what has worked in the past and, as, and what works with uh, other age groups is not going to work for young adults. Um, kids come to church usually because they have to, because their parents force them. Um, uh, adults with children maybe are drawn to churches that offer something for kids, or, or maybe they're asking themselves you know, bigger questions around their faith and their eternal souls. Again, they're thinking long term, but young adults are different. Their priorities are different. Uh, so if you're questioning why we don't see young adults in the church, uh, understand that there are things that are in our control and we need to embrace the things that are not in our control. Um, but what you might not be able to control is how cool your worship team is or how expensive your lights are or how dynamic your preaching is. Um, those are cool things to have. And if you have them, great. Those are, are bonuses which can help draw people in, but they're not what young adults need to grow in Christ. What's also, what is also not in your control is the external lives of young adults. Young adults may have to move to a new area, a new city. They, they have a work schedule, a school schedule. Uh, they have many other things which are demanding their time, and it makes it difficult to justify uh, attending church on Sundays. Um, the world and the church, for that matter, we have told them, uh, we have told young adults that this is their time to explore. So forgive them when they seem uncommitted to your church. Um, the economy, as we mentioned before, has made it so ending work by 5 p.m. and only working Monday through Friday for some people is a luxury of the old world. So again, forgive your young adults if they can't show up for Bible study or, or help with programs at, at a time that may seem um, perfectly reasonable to you. It just sincerely may not work with, with their lives. Um, but let's talk about what is in our control. Um, and really what does matter when it comes to bringing and keeping young adults in the church. Uh, I mean, people come to church for different reasons. While some people might be drawn to the flashy lights, 
um, or to a stellar worship team. Uh, others might come to church because a friend brought them or there's a family connection. Um, whatever your reason, whatever their reason for walking into the doors of a church, making a commitment of saying, this is my church, this is my home. That's a step that many visitors don't take, old or young. Young adults are longing for certain aspects of a church community. Uh, but one of the biggest things is authenticity, particularly in terms of the community worship and the personal care they receive from people in that community. Um, so young adults want authentic community. Uh, as their peers come and go, um, you know, people move, people go off to college, get new jobs, uh, friendship groups change, etc. Young adults need to know that there is a safe and stable community to return to. Um, I mean, everyone needs community, young or old, we all need community. So seeing people who really care about each other and are intentional about including others in their, in their community is golden. Bonus points if that community is diverse in terms of age and culture. Uh, bonus points if that community has young adult peers that uh, they can easily connect with. Uh, but the community, truth be told, it doesn't need a lot of other young adults. Um, so long as there are people in the church who will actively pour into the young adults for who they are. Um, young adults are also looking for authentic worship. They, they long to know that God is real. Um, in this time when they're figuring things out and figuring what matters to them and who they are, they are longing to know that God is real. Uh, and uh, they're looking for people, for other people who truly believe that. Uh, this generation is one of the most educated groups in the history of the world. They have instant access to all sorts of ideas about God or theories of the universe or philosophies about existence. Um, so authentic worship is key to showing young adults who the church is and why we do it. Again, it's not about the big bands or the stellar lights. Um, you know, there are young adults who may believe in Jesus or who may not believe in Jesus or who may not be rock solid in their faith, or maybe they know a lot about the gospel, but to be in an environment where connection to God is central above everything else shows that the church and its people are genuine in their faith. Uh, again, it's not about the big band that rivals Hillsong. It's about showing people through your presence and your words and your worship that that your need for Jesus is critical in, in your lives, for, for you and your community. Um, for young adults, seeing people worship honestly and openly invites young adults to worship honestly and openly themselves. Um, again, one of the last things um, that young adults really need to uh, what they really need to know is that they are seen and that they are heard. Young adults are looking to step into their own as respected adults, but they know that many people look down on them because of their age. Uh, so telling young adults, either through your words or through your actions, that, um, that you value their voice and that you care what they have to say, uh, that can go really far. Um, the opposite is also true, showing them by your words or your actions that you don't actually care about them, that they will read those signs, they will pick up on those cues. Um, that, this doesn't mean that you have to agree with everything that young adults say, or they have to be, that you have to go along with every idea, not at all. Uh, it does mean taking the time to hear what matters to them, asking open-ended questions that aren't loaded with assumptions, and taking their values into consideration when making decisions. Um, I think young adults, like all of us, uh, we have this desire to be seen. Uh, when young adults return from college or they travel or they just haven't shown up uh, to church in a while for whatever reason, they want to know that their church is excited to receive them back with open arms, without judgment, without the need to earn their way back into the community. Uh, and the more you understand the lives of your individual young adults, uh, the more compassion you can show them and to their needs. Um, for example, um, asking young adults a question like, hey, what do you do for a living? is fine. That can be a stinging question that, that can come with a little bit of baggage if their ideal job, if this, their job isn't their ideal job, or uh, maybe they don't have a steady source of income. That can feel like an awkward question for some young adults. Uh, a better question would be, hey, what are, you, what are you working towards right now? This can be more dignifying uh, as a question which shows your interest in their dreams rather than 
um, you know, where they happen to be right now. It shows uh, your interest in them. A pro tip, if they don't actually have any dreams that they're working on right now, that may be your opportunity to mentor them. Um, just a little pro tip. Um, but I, I really want to just come to a close with all of this, uh, saying that all of this has to do with perspective. Um, the people who were adults, um, th think, think in a bigger sense for a second, people who were adults when smartphones became normal, um, they had to readjust their lives to a new normal. Um, people like me um, who were emerging adults, young adults, uh, during this time when smartphones were becoming more accessible, we were able to quickly adapt to it. And the people who are young adults today may not remember a time before smartphones. Uh, and while that gives them an advantage in understanding this new technology, it also means they have no concept of what the old normal was. If this is the new normal, they don't have the concept of the old normal. Uh, young adults live in a wild time in human history where nothing about the future feels certain, particularly for young people. Uh, young adults are struggling to understand the world around them and their place in it because the world keeps changing and they have no concept of normal to fall back onto. Moreover, by virtue of their age, uh, young adults don't yet have their own fully formed sense of identity to give them courage as their lives and the world continue to change. But, and here's something I, I really want us to hear, when young adults become regular adults, and they will, they will become regular adults, right and proper with no one questioning otherwise, um, then their lives will, will change again, and they will stop seeing themselves as in this state of flux, but they will start to have a permanency mindset saying, this is who I am, this is my life, and this is where I'm going. This time, while they're young adults, this is our chance to help guide their direction towards the kind of adults they will become. Uh, we don't get to decide if they end up at our core or if they go to another core or even to another church outside the Salvation Army. What we can do is love them where they are at rather than where we want them to be and give them the tools they need to find God's direction. Does that make sense? If young adults are in a state of change, this is our opportunity to pour into them, to guide them, mentor them, and show them this is how you find the path that God has for you. Um, I hope that this has been helpful. Again, big takeaway points. Young adults see themselves as in a state of change. They see the world as in a state of change. One day they will solidify and start to think more firmly, more securely, think long-term. So this is our chance to pour into them, be a signpost, show them authentic love, authentic community. Uh, if anyone has any questions, you can always reach out to me. Uh, here's my information, my email, and my phone number. Um, I am very passionate about uh, this topic, and I know some of us have the feeling that we can just dismiss young adults because, oh, well, you know, eventually they'll become adults. Let's not lose this chance. Let's not miss out on this opportunity uh, to really be witnesses to them. Uh, but that's all I have for today. So if anyone has any questions, then happy to to keep talking about this i'll pass it over to summer yeah thanks tice that was awesome that was um really a good um summary of what is the difference between a young adult and an adult um and and uh i really just personally really appreciated everything that you uh, kind of shared especially because i definitely feel that uh that uncertainty of where am I on the line of adult to young adult, and I know we've talked about this, but uh, it is a very interesting topic. Um, so we are going to open up the floor. We have about 20, 25 minutes left of this session. Um, and uh, for those of you who haven't joined the Armory sessions, it tends to be this 30, 30 of um, 30 minutes of the speaker, 30 minutes of kind of discussion of questions and um, different things like that. So um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to unmute or you can type it in the chat and I'll read it for you. I know that's kind of overwhelming sometimes to hit that unmute button, but uh, any questions?
I can start us off with one. Um, I I would be really interested, Tice, to kind of hear um, what you would say about uh, how do we program for young adults, right? Like we look at Anthem and the way that we kind of program and we have to kind of consider, okay, we have to consider housing for young adults that are married. We have to kind of uh, think about those younger, uh, you know, I don't want to say kids, but young adults that have, you know, just coming out of college or, or just going into college and um, considering are people taking vacation and like, can people take off a week? Like, how do you think logistically we could program more for young adults? Sorry. Um, yeah. Uh... It's great that you you bring up that that reality that you're going to have people who are married, people who are are not married, um, people with these different needs, people who have jobs with high demands, people who are ready to say, "I can just drop my job because it's you know it doesn't matter," or maybe I've got this flexible job, whatever it might be. Um, but it's that with that mindset, uh, having the uh, keeping in mind people's different needs, uh, different schedules, different lives. Um, Again, because this generation is, uh, and not just this generation, but because young adults are in a state of, of change, um, it's difficult for them to make plans sometimes and to commit to plans. Um, and it's not just with the church, it's even with their own friends. It's difficult to um, for friends to meet up. Uh, so if you have young adults who say they're going to come to something, um, expect them to be there, but just don't take it personally. if. There's not necessarily that um, that uh, strong commitments uh, and the results of that. Um, but when it comes to to planning things for for young adults, um, easy wins are food, um, just good food, food that actually fills you up. Um, easy wins are paying for it, but also because they are young adults, giving that or rather because they're adults, giving them a little bit of responsibility, saying, "Hey, everyone, ship in." you know, like a few dollars for food. You don't, maybe you don't even have to pay for your whole meal, but just, you know, finding ways to to get their own, um, um, uh, like to, to keep them accountable by putting in a little bit of themselves. That'll help add to the commitment level. It'll help teach them that they are responsible for themselves. They're not children anymore. Um, and it will help them to to feel that that respect of, oh yeah, I am being treated with respect. Um, when I was in college, I was a part of a, a, a fellowship of young adults. We'd meet on Thursdays, and the, the core would cook food, would make this delicious meal, would make way too much food. It was great. And um, the first one was always free. And the next time you showed up, they expected you to pay $1 um, to just contribute. That did not cover the cost of the meal, but it did put in us, uh, instill in us that idea of, oh, I need to, I need to contribute to this. And when you didn't do that, you felt like a loser and it was on your tail. Uh, but it was, you know, it wasn't a judgment kind of thing. It was just um, this idea of, hey, we're all doing this together. Uh, so then there was that personal uh, investment. And if people didn't show up one week because they were busy, they had school, they had to do homework, whatever it was, um, there wasn't judgment, but there was definitely that follow-up afterward. And the follow-up after that, follow-up after that, hey, we missed you. Hey, we haven't seen you in a while. Hey, I know we only met once. But we miss you. So again, don't be afraid to, to reach out multiple times. Expect them to show up without judgment. It's a hard balance to strike, but that's that's what I'd say is is don't be afraid to continue to ask, continue to invite, and expect people to to contribute in their own way. Yeah, I really like that. Um, and I even think about uh, when my parents were in a youth worker training school that uh, they would have anybody who came to their house and like to our house, uh, they would do all of these crazy fun events. And then my mom would always say, okay, first time you're a friend and you're like a guest in our house. Second time that you come, you're part of the family, which means you help clean up. And uh, I, I appreciate that balance of responsibility, but also um, provision. And I think that I really like that dollar idea. Um, any other questions? Anybody? Uh, Captain Ernie said, 
It's not always easy for older adults to make plans. When I was younger, I rarely made plans because I knew that something would roadblock. Under understandable. That's it's always tough. Uh, anybody else? I was just going to add to what Ty said about planning. I think where possible, involve the young adults to plan to say, hey, uh, if we're going to meet regularly, what kind of things do you want to do? Um, it could be that you want to you know, play board games and finish your time with a devotion, or you want to play basketball, or you want to just do a Bible study. Um, so I think getting the input of the young adults. Uh, obviously, if you're a leader, you want to have a general direction of where you want to go. But if you could incorporate some of their input, I think it's uh, always uh, welcomed. I'll, I'll, you know, add more to that too. Yeah, it's, I think for for youth ministry, for kids, there's the the idea that we have to plan everything, do everything. Um, and we do, to, to an extent we do. Uh, with young adults, it, they are really the ones who make it fun. Whatever it is you're doing, it's it's up to them whether or not it's fun. They, they have that... Um, that social ability to decide if they're going to have fun, but also that internal ability to decide, are, are we going to have fun tonight? And how is it going to be fun? And why is it going to be fun? Um, which is difficult. I know some of us want to just like have the power to make it fun, but just rest in the fact that, you know, it's, it's not all on you. And um, if your young adults do make it fun, they will make it fun um, if they are ready to jump in. Some of us need a little more encouragement, um, especially if we don't know anyone or we're a little shy or introverted and we're just not sure what to do. Um, so, so have a plan in mind when you're programming for young adults, but also remember that they are also stakeholders in this. They can make decisions to for themselves to, to participate. And hey, suddenly we're playing a game. Hey, suddenly we're talking about this. Just go with the flow to an extent. Um, so another, anybody else have questions? Okay, so um, I would ask Tice, um, how do you feel like there's a good way of pulling young adults in to be leaders? Um, I know that when I was, when I first moved out here, um, I was invited to come participate in the core cadets at my core and I was a little bit hesitant because I didn't want to have something on my calendar every Wednesday. Um, and I remember I think that I started coming like I got invited and it was like just come once and see how you like it and I was like oh, okay and I went and then it was like there was food and then I got asked to help teach and then it kind of just fell into this old thing but um especially with that hesitancy and the desire to not plan to like not have things super bound. How do we encourage our young adults to step into leadership roles, to do things like join core council, to do things like lead this thing? What, what would you suggest? Um, as someone who was raised in the Salvation Army and uh, often went to small core, I was usually part of small core that had very few leaders uh, of which my mother was you know, half of the leadership. Um, it, I, I know that there is, uh, there are a lot of young adults who maybe are, are already doing things uh, in some sort of leadership position. They're helping with kids programs or they're in the worship team or, or whatever it might be. Um, but uh, to answer your question, I'd, I'd almost want to pull back and, you know, as, as you look at someone, you're looking at a young adult saying, okay, this person's this person is an adult. They are, um, they have enough wherewithal for me to have a real conversation with them. Uh, maybe they they have some experience here or there. You know, think you know how might they be able to contribute uh, to the community, not just with one dollar for a meal, but uh, you know, in a leadership role. Uh, but bear in mind that people's experience uh, as leaders may be widely different depending on their experience. Um, they, they may have maybe have worked at camp and um, you think, oh yeah, so they're great with kids, but maybe they weren't in a you know, front facing kind of role. Maybe they were on maintenance and weren't interacting with the kids as much. Um, so really pulling back and saying, you know, what is this person's 
what are these person's strengths? What are these person's passions? Um, and how can I, uh, how can I lean into that, pour into that? I had some core officers who kept telling me, you have to do it. You have to, you have to do it, but you know, and like, you have to make these programs and you have to teach the kids and you have to do this and you're so good at this. So just do it. And I didn't know what that meant because that's literally what they said. Oh, these kids have to do music and you have to do it. And I, I didn't know how to lead a kid's um, music program. I could do one-on-one -on -one lessons, but I didn't know how to, how to organize uh, a whole program. Uh, all this to say, um, start small, um, shadowing, uh, having a young adult shadow you or shadow one of your leaders uh, as uh, as they lead. You know, let's take troops as an example of, you know, if you have a troops leader um, who's with the kids, having the young adult shadow them and, you know, after a few weeks saying, hey, I want you to lead this part of the activity. Do you feel comfortable with that? I want you to lead this part of the activity. Really show your your belief in them. Um, at, they will, that, even if they're nervous, you, you can inspire them to say, hey, I believe in you. I think you can do it. Um, and if they can, in fact, do it and they do successfully uh, lead that part of the activity, maybe, hey, next week, um, you know, I'll start us off, but then can you take over the rest of the lesson? Um, but again, you know, they may, they may not know what you assume they know. So don't be afraid to overshare, to train, to teach. Um, and if you find that someone sort of reached their capacity as a leader and, you know, maybe they're more helpful as a, as a helper uh, or maybe they're more helpful behind the scenes or, yeah, they're just great in front of a crowd, um, lean into that. Um, try and encourage them where you can, but uh, take it step by step. Thanks, Tice. And I would even say to go like even a step beyond that, I think it also starts in that like primary slash tween age kind of years of saying, hey, we're in core cadets. Somebody's going to be praying. Who is it going to be? You know, like, you know, I, and kind of allowing for those opportunities for them to take ownership for themselves as well as then later on, they're kind of have a little bit more confidence because if, you know, you're just starting to introduce this as somebody's becoming a young adult, well, then that's really overwhelming. <laughs> you know, like if, if, if I hadn't ever taught kids at some point, I would not feel t comfortable teaching core cadets. But because, you know, I have more experience in that and I kind of went into that a lot younger, it made it a lot easier for me to step into that leadership role. So I would say train them while they're young, you know, and like that's the Salvation Army way, right? Is, you know, <laughs> you get, you become a soldier and you get, you know, smacked on the head with a Bible and like go out and tell your testimony. But uh, that's what we we're found in. Um, we have a question in the chat from Joseph and he says, what are some ways to invite young adults to church? Hmm. This goes into uh, evangelism, which um, some of these things may apply to any adults uh, across the board. Um, part of it has to do with that mindset that I talked about. Just know that, um, again, that that young adult, older adult split is, you know, who is thinking more permanently. Um, if my mindset as, as an older adult is, you know, this is my schedule, this is my life, this is what I care about. Um, and I'm not someone who goes to church, then coming to church would be a change in that, um, in the, that plan and that structure. Um, but that might be a welcome change. And if you get an older adult in, uh, to come to church regularly, you know, again, they may start to see themselves as a part of the community to come regularly. Young adults, um, maybe their schedule is more fluid and more flexible, or at least they perceive their schedule as being more fluid and flexible, which may mean they have the time to suddenly go to church. Um, it may also mean that they might suddenly not go to church, even though they said they would. Um, but uh, that's, that's something to keep in mind as you make those invitations. Um, something else to keep in mind is um, where the young adult might be at, what you know about them. If there's someone who maybe, you know, would call themselves a Christian, or if you know that they grew up in the church, that will be different than if you know, or if you don't know that, or if you know that this is not a churched person, this is not someone who considers themselves a Christian, uh, that would have to do with more of the approach and how you make the invitation. Um, in, in general, uh, so I mean, it's, it's scary to invite your friends to church. It's, it's scary to, to say, hey, do you want to hang out with me and Jesus? 
Um, you know, no matter who it is, I, I feel that fear. Some people are great about it. God bless them. Uh, but uh, when it comes to making the invitation, just know that if you make the invitation and they they do come, that's, that may not be a guarantee that they'll come the next week. That might not be a guarantee they'll, they'll be there a month from now. It may take multiple invitations. Um, and it won't just be on you. This is an opportunity for, for your church to also step up and uh, and say, hey, welcome. Hey, I remember you. Hey, nice to meet you. I haven't seen you before, met you before. Oh, I remember you from last week, you know, whatever it might be, um, uh, to really invite the person in to the community. Uh, and again, letting that person know, hey, you have a home here and you didn't have to earn it. Um, that does require them to come into the doors uh, in the first place. Uh, but just, again, know that for young adults, it's it's less, it may be for you, it may be for them, less about um, trying to grab them and like pull them in and keep them in the church and shut the doors, you know, uh, and maybe more about um, setting out, again, setting them up for success for the future. So they know, hey, this is what church feels like. This is, this is what it feels like. So that um, as they start to think, you know, ah, man, what am I even doing? I don't know. Uh, they can start to think, you know, I, I felt, I felt safe at church and I felt welcome at church. Um, I remember when I was in, in college, um, there were two young adult uh, fellowships, two student fellowship groups that I was um, sort of bouncing around back and forth uh, between. Um, but I, I ended up really falling in love with one over the other. Um, the one I didn't stay around with um, was because uh, it seemed like a judgmental place that judged me for where they wanted me to be as a Christian rather than where I was as a Christian, which was someone who was still figuring things out and still trying to figure things. And I was wrestling with what God had for me. Um, but I felt like they were judging me for not knowing who I was and knowing God's plan for me. The other group um, I felt a lot safer with and a lot more loved um, because they they actually gave me uh, avenues to explore. They said, hey, here in, in conversation, one-on-one -on -one conversations, even just sermons and messages saying, hey, you know, explore what does God have for you? And maybe it looks like this and maybe it looks like this. Um, but it, so it, it became a safe place for me to grow rather than the other one, which was, all right, you're an adult now, step up, be a leader, do this, do that. And I'm like, you know, I'm not ready. I'm scared. Uh, I know I'm 19, but I feel like a child. Um, so again, it, the invitation itself is scary, but just working to make sure that, you know, this is a safe place for young adults. And I, and these people around me, we, we pour into people when they come in through our doors. Can I jump into, um, this is probably one of the harder things to do in a, in a core and a ministry is to invite people through our doors, um, especially if they're unchurched. Uh, probably depends on what kind of outreach opportunities do we have? Are we able to have contact with clients as they walk through the food pantry or if we have a shelter. Uh, one of the cores that we had a drop-in basketball program for adults. So that was a place to meet young adults. The challenge is always really about developing that relationship. Is it somebody I consistently and say, hey, how are you doing? Get to know them. Um, it, it really comes with developing relationships if it's people we don't really have any other contact with. Uh, and if you do develop a friendship, that it could come to a point where you say, hey, you want to get coffee with me and have a regular contact with them or you're getting to know them where they are in life um, without really the pressure, hey, I've you've had you know, free coffee on me three times now, let's go, you got to come to church. I think it needs to be an, a natural way of connecting with people as we would develop any other friendship or relationship. A lot of times we don't really know how quickly it develops. We we look back and we realize we're now friends. Um, and I think that's the same way we, we should do outreach or evangelism in general, but young adults, um, that's the challenge. If we're an opportunity to mentor people or befriend people, if you have other young adults, that might be the best way to invite other young adults is you know, peer-to-peer -peer evangelism, essentially, or outreach versus maybe somebody in kind of from a different generation, not saying God cannot use those opportunities, uh, but if you have one or two young adults, maybe 
talking with them and say, hey, how can we invite people here? Or if you were not in church before, how could somebody reach out to you? Um, so even asking the opinion of other young adults, uh, if you have any, even one, I think would, would go a long way. Thank you, Major, because I, 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 you say that and I want to keep piggybacking off of what you're saying. Um, if you're finding that, in, in, as you have those conversations with, with the young adults you have, you know, maybe a good question is, how can we make this a safe place for you and your friend? How can we make this a place you want to invite your friends to? Um, uh, I think that's a great way to do that. If you're saying, I don't have any young adults. I don't interact with young adults. You know, I don't work on a college campus. You know, what can we do? Think about the people who serve you coffee and the people who work at restaurants and your Uber driver. I know not everyone takes Uber or Lyft, but maybe just try it just to see who you interact with. Um, again, it always has to be natural, but you know, if you're, um, your or your Amazon driver, whoever, whoever it might be that you interact with just going about your business, those might be opportunities for you to have a conversation. It's scary, but if you act like you're not scared, then it will make it easier for them usually. Um, uh, and if you're like really desperate, but you're like, I, I feel this need to, to connect with young adults, contact your DYS, say, hey, I live in this area. Is there anyone who worked at camp this past summer who maybe lives in this area? There are lots of people who work at camp several years in a row and they never go to a church, they never go to a core that just, they don't have that connection for whatever reason. This would be a great opportunity to reach out and say, hey, you know, I'm from the Salvation Army here. I know you work at camp. Can we go get coffee? Or can, or can like, I invite you to my house, you know, like to do dinner or whatever it is. Uh, again, just some ideas. Reach out to your camp people. Thanks, Tice. That's great. Any final questions? I think we have time for one more. Okay. Um, I'll just finish it off by saying. Actually, um, sorry, I do oh, have one question. Hey, sorry. Go for it. Go um, for it. So, as a young adult myself who's having to lead young adult programs, how can I be intentional in these relationships and not feel like I'm participating, but truly like leading and guiding? Yeah, that's that's the hard that's the hard thing. I feel like this speaks to leadership as well for for older adults, but it's something that um, has been challenging for me at working in this job, you know, at at Anthem or with Service Corps is. I want to be, you know, part of the gang, one of the guys, but I also have, I'm also older, right? I'm married, I have a child, maybe I'm bald, maybe people don't see, see me. They're like, oh no, he's the old guy in charge. But um, but that's that's very real of, of wanting to be a part of it and wanting to, to enjoy it. Uh, and it, it can be really difficult and scary to pull back and say, yes, I am a part of it. I am here, but it's about them and it's about making sure that these friendships are developed and these are fostered um, not neglecting individual relationships you may have with the individuals um, but you know like if it's like a bible study making sure that um, you know young adults feel like they are smart and that they know things and so you know making it a, an environment where they can talk to each other not just looking to you for all the answers um, or you know having um the the type of of prayerful or worshipful moment where it's like hey this is this is for them and it's not for them it's for god you know they still need someone in their life the leader to to organize to plan um but i think at that like i said you know with the fun the fun is on them with the the interest in the bible or worship it ultimately falls to them um our role as leaders is to be the organizer is to be the one who makes the phone calls um you know, even like in a friend group to, to have that one person who actually follows up and actually says, hey, let's get together, you know, to have that initiative and to be the, the driver of that community. That uh, I think when we remember that that's really our role is to be the driver um, and, and allowing other people to, allowing the young adults to, to really be the, the content, to be the people who are having the discussion or who are singing or having the worship, whatever it might be, or having the fun, whatever it might be, 
Um, just know that you are the driver of the, the, you're the organizer, you're the facilitator, but they're the ones actually driving the, 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 the program itself, if, if that makes sense. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. I think even in some ways, um, it's a little bit of like finding that balance of like, Yes, I like I'm 25 and I <laughs> that's also something I struggle with of trying to find that balance of like, hey, we're like the same age, but also obviously I have a very different responsibility in this. And I think that the main ways that you kind of define that is through like your training and kind of what Tice was saying in terms of the responsibility of making sure that you hold yourself to a higher responsibility and a higher standard of saying, okay, maybe, you know, I need to, you know, come to trainings like these, or maybe I need to be more in the word. I need to, you know, take, do more additional training on what it means to be a leader in that. But I think that uh, outside of that, I think that there's strength in kind of being close to that age and being able to say, hey, I'm going to still step up and I'm going to be a leader in this. Like, I think about my, my current friend group, uh, it has a 39 year old a 33 year old a 25 year old and a 24 year old and it's even though the uh, two of them are obviously a, a lot older than the other two um there isn't kind of like a we're all kind of in a similar space and it, it becomes kind of this dynamic of bringing you know utilizing each other's strengths in a way that strengthens our friendship and kind of strengthens uh just our you know, like just like the group that we have and the dynamics that we have. And um, I think that there's so much value to uh, investing in that. Um, but I would definitely say if you want to kind of have that established like leadership and you, you're you kind of like managing a program, I think that there's obviously some semblance of boundaries that would really help uh, determine that. And I think that understanding those boundaries for yourself personally of saying, you know, maybe if I'm a leader, I don't want to be too emotionally vulnerable where it's like you can see my emotions i will share my experience but maybe be have more clear boundaries when it comes to emotional vulnerability um i think that that could kind of set apart that difference of being a leader in a group versus being in a group of young adults um but yeah that's my two cents on that uh and then tyson said in the chat um, don't think that you're too old and don't think that you're too young. And I, I really agree with that. Yeah. It's just knowing that there's, I mean, in some ways there is very much a, a state of mind of understanding and valuing just, you know, what's what, like, what, what do you value? And, and I think that the strength is in finding similar values and, and valuing each other. Um, any final comments guys, before we close off? Okay, well, um, thank you everybody for joining back again for Armory season three. Um, in two weeks, we'll be hearing from Jim Sparks uh, about understanding teens and tweens. So we're gonna go down the slope of age and then we'll pop back up for youth leaders and officers. Um, thank you all for jumping on. Uh, hopefully we'll see you again in two weeks. And uh, thank you, Tice, for everything that you had to share. Um, for sharing it so thoroughly and just so maturely. So thank you for that. And bye, everybody. We'll see you next time.